So welcome once again to the Profitable Green Mealy Production Webinar, where we have thought it prudent for us and agribusiness media to partner in this timely presentation where we need to discuss issues to do with increasing profitability by making sure that you know some of the growing windows that are going to make you realize a lucrative return over the other times in which the farmers will be establishing their crops. So at this time, we want to talk about green mealy production. Why now, at a time when we are saying it's already running a bit late for you to be establishing your maize, we are talking to those farmers with irrigation to then come in and supplement once the rains have terminated and be able to harvest before the onset of the winter season or before the incidence of frost occurs in their growing area. So the presentation is as follows. I'm going to start off by highlighting why green mealy production is important because nowadays there's talk of farming more as a business than as something that you just do to pass time. So in business, you need to understand the nitty gritties that make it the difference between you making money or running a loss. So we want to talk about the profitability of um, green mealy production. We'll then look at the essential elements for production. Then we will look at the good agronomic practices that need to be employed for you to say you are realizing value out of the green mealies and the varieties, the executive genetics that you will have established. We also need to talk about the new seed genetics that are in the pipeline. Then we'll give you a take home message and show you some of the green mealy activities that is happening currently across the country. One of the most famous people who I like and is a mentor is um, the two time president of the African Development Bank, Akunume Adesina, who said, and I quote, they are a set of billionaires that we are going to be having, the next set of billionaires, and they're going to be farmers. So who doesn't want to be a billionaire? It's time for us to jump onto the bandwagon and make sure that we are aligning to the next set of events that is going to align us correctly to line our pockets. So in terms of green mealy production, why green mealy production? Why would you want to venture into maize production and sell the maize while they are fresh cobs? Green mealies is a cash crop. That's the first thing that you really need to take note of. Being a cash crop, it means that it has a high return on investment, which is to say the amount of money that you're going to use in establishing and the money that you're going to get ultimately when you sell your produce guided by the demand and supply matrix, which is to say if you're going to be selling at a window when the supply is low, then you're going to be getting a higher return. Then there's also issues to do with enhancement of cash flows. In farming, as a business, you need to understand that continuous supply of cash is also important in any enterprise for you to be profitable and for you to be sustainable at a farm or any um, um, any area where you're going to be doing your, your, your cropping. So for you to get multiple cropping programs at a time in a season, particularly if you have irrigation, is a must. So you need to make sure that at least after every two months, three months, you're harvesting something and going to the market for you to then say you're getting value. Then there is the issue to do with increased income streams, where you're not just looking at one avenue. Maybe you're doing poultry, you're doing animal husbandry, you are growing horticulture, but you also need to think of green millies as an income stream for you to also ease the burden on paying wages and being liquid at the farm. It is also a good crop of choice in terms of health conditions where you're going to be consuming your grain, your fresh grain. There's also some nutritional value that you're going to get from it. It is an effective land use utilization option where it promotes double or multiple cropping, so to say, whereby if you can be, you're in a frost free area, you can even do it through winter, particularly those farmers who are in the low road. Then it is also to do with the issues to do with uh, uh, employment creation, whereby we also need to contribute and play our part in easing the burden of unemployment by making sure that our operations are also employing other people and making sure that we are adding value to the communities around us, be it in a farming community, if we have um, areas that we are going to be establishing the crop. Then walking the profit story. Profitability really needs to be taken into account when you are doing anything as a business. So here we are saying, what is the gross margin principle for green mealy production to be profitable? For every dollar invested, you can get 
plus two dollars under good agronomic practices, which is to say, if you have invested a dollar and you get more than two dollars, it's more than double the level of investment that you will have incurred. It's a profitable venture because nowadays, if you're going to be getting a profit of 50 cents, 30 cents, 10 cents for something that you will be doing, you are profitable. What more if you're getting more than double the return? It means that venture is very, very lucrative. Yes, again, guided by the window in which you're going to be selling the crop. Then we look at uh, the cost of production ranging between 800 to about $900 per hectare, uh, give or take, depending on your source of inputs, as well as um, you having analyzed your soil to get the required amount of nutrition for you to be uh, applying to your crop. So the total variable costs includes the seed, the fertilizer, pesticides, irrigation, the labor that you're going to be using. But in some cases, the labor cost is reduced if you're going to be employing um, uh, the labor that you have at hand. But it needs to be factored in, even if the family is coming in to the farm to help with the planting, with the weeding, you need to factor in the hours that they are putting in, the amount of work that they are putting in for you to be able to cost that and uh, become uh, a, a business that really factors in the cost structure so that in a, in a time when you, they, those people are not available, you are still going to be able to get the same result. Then the, uh, when you're going to be doing your green millies, the number of dozens that you can expect to get per hectare will range between 3,000 to 3,500 dozens per hectare. This is guided, of course, by the plant population and the level of management that you're going to employ in your crop so that ultimately the crop stand sustains. So 3,000 to 3,500 dozens of green millies are recommended per hectare. And imagine if one dozen fetches between $1.20 to $1.50. And in the Christmas window, we saw some farmers realizing up to $2.50 with uh, a, from a dozen, which is to say the return was quite, quite high. The margins, the profitability was quite high. And in terms of the US dollar value, it can range from 3,600 to well above uh, 4,500, guided of course by the number of uh, dozens that you're going to get and the cost, uh, the price at which you're going to be selling at that time. The recommended uh, thing for farmers to also consider is to stagger their crop and not have a crop that is at the same age uh, of maturity because you also want to stagger and get a wider harvesting window for you to be more profitable. Then just moving on to look at the issues to do with the frost avoidance and why. Maize is one of the crops which is sensitive to frost. So in the, in, in the event that you are going to want to establish green millies in a frost prone area, you might want to consider doing it just before winter, which is now, whereby you also get some supplementary rainfall to come in and work with your irrigation once the rain is terminated, or after winter, which is to say you have two windows to consider, before winter or after winter. This is for the frost, frost prone areas. Then there is the, also the issues to do with the frost resulting in floral sterility at critical stages of growth, whereby the crop might be attractive, lush green, clean, weed free, but when the frost hits at a critical growth stage, then you might be found wanting. So if you're going to be establishing during a critical stage where frost is prone, you also need to take note of that and understand if you're going to be employing some frost mitigation measures, you need to come in with them at critical times when frost is prone in your area then you might end up also producing unsellable small cobs because even the heat units that are experienced during the time of frost will be quite low. The optimum sowing time as highlighted would be after the frost occurrence or before the periods where frost is prone. But in the high veld, after the last week of July is what we recommend in the low veld area any time of the year, which is why the people in the low veld area are also now thinking of starting to grow their maize even end of March, early May, getting into winter, because at that time they have high heat units for them to also sustain their crop throughout the winter period. But suffice to say that maize is susceptible to frost. So in frost prone areas and at critical times when you know that frost is, where is most likely to okay, it's best to avoid establishing uh, green mealy, which is why we thought it prudent for us to talk about this now where we are saying within the next two weeks, with irrigation to supplement, establish your green mealy and you will be selling during the start of winter or just before the winter starts. 
So to unlock the genetic potential of the exceptional executive CITCO genetics that we have, it's important for us to employ good agronomic practices, which also include the soil, understanding the soil type, nurturing our soil, understanding the fertility that we're going to employ, weed management, insect pest management as well, looking at, at uh, problems like four armworm, the, the leaf warpers, which might carry the metric virus, diseases, variety selection, which is the gist of the discussion today, whether herbicide management and ultimately the management that the farmer is going to employ. The secret weapon or the secret ingredient in any farming operation is the farmer's footprint. If you are not going to be present, constantly monitoring and scouting, checking on your crop regularly and making sure that you are doing thing, ti things timelessly, you will be found wanting. Even with the good genetics that you will have um, established, if you don't employ good agronomic practices, you might be found wanting. So we are now uh, going to discuss issues to do with planting, whereby the land preparation comes into play. You need to understand that there are two critical methods of land preparation that can be employed, the conventional or conservation method. We want to move hand in glove with the sustainable agriculture initiatives that the globe is pushing for, whereby we are talking more of conservation farming. We want to also sustain and conserve our environment for future generations to also benefit. So this is not just for the resource uh, constrained farmers. Even the resource endowed farmers can also employ conservation by investing in the correct implements that are going to allow them to establish using conservation like your no-till, strip-till planters, they can also come in with that. The mulching concept also needs to be observed and the rotations for you to successfully say you are embracing conservation. So in whichever method of uh, tillage that you're going to be using, you need to end up in the growing area, getting a fine tilt, be it the planting station or the planting row, or if you're going to be doing the conventional methods of tillage, uh, you also need to also factor in that uh, you need a fine tilt for you to get good germination and crop images, and ultimately for you to get the, uh, the maximum number of plants per hectare. The optimum plant population that we recommend for green mealies ranges between 40,000 to 44,000 plants per hectare. Why does it seem like we are going a step back in terms of the plant population for green mealies? This is with reason. We want to make sure that we get sizable cobs that are sellable on the market. You would want a situation whereby you are saying, I'm selling these cobs for a dollar for four, a dollar for five, instead of dollar for 20 or dollar for five or dollar for eight or 10. Uh, if the cobs are small, it means you are going to put in more. So if you have sizable, extra large sized cobs, it also gives you an advantage on the market. So we recommend 40 to 44,000 plants per hectare. Yes, some farmers go as high as 48,000 plants per hectare. It's still within the mark, 50,000 still within the mark, but the recommended 40,000 to 44,000 plants per hectare will give you the 3,000 to 3,500 dozens that we recommend. For you to achieve that, the interval spacing will be at around 90 centimeters. While the in row will range from 25 to around uh, 20, 22, 23 uh, centimeters. Then 95% of the population produces sizable cobs under good management. Good management is the secret ingredient. Otherwise, you won't be able to unlock the value in the genetics. The seed rate will be at 25 kgs per hectare, or if you want precision, you can go for the 50,000 kennel packs, which will give you more than 50,000 seeds to establish. So at a recommendation of 44,000, you will be well within the mark. It's recommended for you to use seed dressing chemicals, particularly if you're going to be growing off the time when most of the other people will be establishing off season, establishing their, their maize crop, just to mitigate the risk of um, maize, uh, maize streak virus. And you can also be scouting regularly and making sure that the field surrounding the, uh, the area where you're going to be planting is weed free, because that's where the insect pests are harbored. The insect pests that include the leaf hoppers, which have the chance of caring and being vectors for the main street virus might also be harbored there. So you don't want weeds around your crop. It's just dirty, but it's also a, 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 an environment where insect pests can also be harbored and diseases as well. Then in terms of fertilizer management, we also hasten to say that uh, effective nutrition management is governed by soil analysis. We continue to hammer on this because we know that 
adaptation is also uh, something that is different. People are not going to adapt at the same time. So we continue to speak about this gospel of soil analysis with the hope that our farmers will understand the importance of getting custom-made fertilizer recommendations, which are also going to speak to their cropping area. So we also need to understand in terms of the universal principles of soil analysis that include your, so the right type of fertilizer that you're going to be applying, the right quantities, the right time. You know there is the law of um, uh, diminishing returns, where in some instances there might be just one element or one, a one, one nutrient that might become a limiting factor for all the other nutrients to work effectively. So you don't want that occurring uh, in your in your cropping program. So. Um, Leibig's law of the uh, limiting factor, you need to understand that you need all the factors to be constant for them to work optimally. So in, in terms of the basal fertilizer, we recommend a range of between 300 to 400 kgs per hectare. As a general rule, we know that uh, some of you also uh, want to put pen to paper to write the general recommendation, but we want you to move away from that. We also really want to recommend for you to analyze yourself, for you to make informed decisions. In terms of the NPK ratio, you also need to be guided by the fertilizer you're using. Are you using compounds? Are you using the blends, the specialized fertilizers that are available on the market now, where you have your 142814 and you also have uh, your fertilizer of choice, your 62323, which is a higher nutritional value per unit. So these are some of the fertilizer options that are available, but you may engage your fertilizer uh, agronomists for more information on nutrition management. You don't want a scenario there where we are seeing the nutrition deficiencies that are there on your leaves, when in essence you could have come in with the correct fertilizer or foliar fertilizer, booster fertilizers that you could have applied. In terms of top dressing fertilizer, a range of 350 to 400 kgs per hectare is recommended. And AN split application in sandy soils is also recommended, particularly given the nature of the rains that we have uh, this year whereby we can have persistent or incessant rains. It's important for us to stagger our application of ammonium nitrate fertilizer so that it doesn't leach and go below the, the root zone. Some farmers this year opted to use urea, which is something we can also still do getting into our green milli window uh, in the next three weeks, four weeks when our crop is entering the vegetative stage. Um, you might want to come in with your, your urea, uh, which is a slow release fertilizer um, if given the moisture, if there's moisture, it will dissolve immediately and it will start working. But if there's no moisture on the ground, there's little moisture, you might want to cover it slightly to avoid the risk of volatilization, which is to say it might be taken up into the atmosphere and not work as is supposed to. But there are now some coated urea elements available on the market, which you can also use with, uh, which you might not need to cover. But now with the moisture that we have, you find that urea might just dissolve immediately. Then looking at weed management, weeds compete with our crop for almost everything. They will compete for the sun, sunlight, for the growing space. They will compete for the nutrients that we will have availed. They will compete just to be there. But the secret that the weeds have is an understanding that they are growing where they are not wanted. Because the simple definition of a weed is a plant which is growing where it's not wanted. So if you have a crop of sugar bean or soya bean, you have a tomato, beautiful tomato crop growing in a field of maize, then it becomes a weed because at that time it's not wanted. So anything that is growing where it's not wanted is a weed. It has the potential to reduce your yield level that you're going to get. So there are options that you can employ, manual or mechanical weeding. You can also choose to do that, though it's tedious. But in some instances, the area might not be big or the labor might be readily available. So you can choose to use that. But in terms of chemical control, you need to use it, but be guided accordingly in terms of the nitty gritties or principles of effective herbicide use, which include an understanding of the weed spectrum that includes the broad leaves, grasses, or sages. You can also, you might need to also get an appreciation of the stage of control. Are you coming in pre-emergent? Are you coming in post emergence Is the product you are using non-selective 100% or it's non-selective um, at planting, but it means that you, your crop must also not be there in the field. So you need to understand all these principles, all these uh, rules that apply to herbicide use, effective herbicide use. The rotation plan also comes into play. Where in business you have a cropping plan, where you know that after the maize, I'm coming in with my onion, I want to do potato, it's paying very well now. I want to come in with our, um, you, I want to come in with my cake a bit. 
I want to come in with my brassica crop. But if you don't understand the rotation at the time when you're applying your herbicide, you might be found wanting when you want to plant a crop that is sensitive to the product that you will be using. So this is something that you also need to bear in mind as you uh, choose uh, your herbicides that you're going to be using. The cost as well. Nowadays, there's a wide range of options that are available. I want to dwell much into that as uh, my brother, my able brother, the agronomist from CP Chemicals is going to come in and dwell deeper in terms of your herbicide use, your insecticide use, and all the other products that you have. Suffice to say that CP has some of the very good um, chemistry that will also add value to your cropping programs. We don't want you to have a situation whereby you have scenario A, where the crop looks pale. It doesn't look healthy. The farmer might have applied the basal fertilizer, but it was most of it was taken up by the crop, the, the, by the weed, which has a competitive edge over the crop. It knows it's growing where it's not wanted. So it, it, it competes and grows very fast. So that is very important for us to understand. Then we also have an issue uh, whereby we don't want scenario B there, where we are failing to understand, is it a broad leaf crop which was established? Is it maize? Is there a crop to even begin with? So we don't want to, to grow weeds at the expense of the crop. Scenario C is close to home, but you are seeing that the crop is not looking very healthy. We want the ideal scenario D or the ideal case there where you are seeing the ground is clean. There's nothing on the ground. It's clear and you can see from the crop that it's lush, green and happy to be growing in that environment. In terms of insect pest management, the critical thing that you need to know is for you to understand that any crop has its problematic insect pests. So you need to factor in that before you even establish the crop. Know the problem insects you are most likely to incur. For maize, you need to know that cutworms might come in and just cut. The cutworms, uh, by the way, are nocturnal. So you might not see them during the day. They'll be just hiding just under the surface of the ground. Then the next thing you see are cut um, plants. So the population now will be reduced and you won't get the 44,000 plants that we might be uh, highlighting. So also you're talking about the white grubs there, particularly if organic matter is being used, uh, cattle manure is being used, you might find that. I'm sure CP chemicals have chemicals to speak to that. Then we might have the army worm, you know, the masses of worms that move in the field within a couple of hours to a few days devastation will have to okay. Then we have the problematic nuisance for armworm, which has been a problem for the past couple of years. Then of course the African stock border, whereby it will burrow inside the stock and uh, consume and affect the, um, the crop from growing optimally. So the damage that you might get from four armyworm, as you rightfully know, I'm sure at this stage, we have all encountered some four armyworm damage, be it on our five lines of maize grown at the backyard or on our large scale production. This is something that we have incurred. So four armyworm, we need to be on top of the situation. Control, optimum control comes in if we come early, the first insta, or you can just crush the egg masses. We want to employ integrated pest management in our operations for us to also uh, think of uh, sustainability and safeguarding the environment. Then in terms of green mealies, what are the factors that farmers look at in terms of selection of the varieties as we move to the gist of the variety selection and wind up? In terms of the green mealies uh, selection, you need to select varieties that give you the attractive long sized cob. As you can see there, one of our agronomists showcasing an extra large sized cob of AC727, almost as plum as he is, who wouldn't want a green mealy cob like that? So cob size matters, long attractive cobs. You want kennel set, deep seated kennels. We want to make sure that the area that we have covered by the core, by the core is much smaller than the area covered by the grain, which is to say there is value there that we are getting. We are not growing the maize for us to get the cobs. We need to know the economic uh, yields that we are targeting. Then the dry down rate as well, you need to factor that in because for green millies, the longer the window you have to harvest, the better your chances of selling for a longer time and getting a, a higher return, even if the market prices fluctuate. The tolerance to diseases as well. Suffice to say that seed cover varieties have very good tolerance to problematic diseases, but you also need to take care of your environment so that you don't introduce uh, problematic um, diseases to your crop um, just by poor hygiene. Then in terms of the varieties, the varieties that we have at Seedco, 
in terms of uh, adding value. From our very early maturity, we have our SD419. We are just highlighting some of the varieties that we have out of an extensively large product basket. So 419 falls within the very early maturity. It has the ability to give you um, a very, a very good uh, sized cobs in terms of green millies. Uh, and it's, it's a white uh, maize variety. And in terms of green mealy maturity, it will mature within a plus or minus 110 days. Then here we have the next set of varieties, which is the, uh, the yellow maize 402. Suffice to say that if you're going to be establishing 402, you need to stagger the crop so that you have a wider uh, uh, harvesting window and you also reduce the dry down. Then in terms of the 500 series, we have the variety that most of us have an experience with SC513. It's sweet. Most farmers want to have attested to the fact that it's a sweet variety. It's an, it's, an, it's an elastic variety in terms of performance. It's quite tolerant to stress. But we also need to embrace new genetics that have been availed. Because with a new thing, in most cases, there will have been some added advantages that will have been associated with that. So it's up to us to embrace new things that are coming up, particularly looking at the new blockbuster early maturing varieties where we have SC555. Really, SC555 has uh, taken the market by storm, whereby we are having very positive reviews of it, performing, be it as a green mealy variety, as a silage variety, as a grain variety. But today, speaking about green mealies, it produces extra large size cobs, as you can see there, which are sweet, and it also has a dark green color, which also allows it to have a, a wider silage cutting window which makes we, uh, a, a wider harvesting window for, for green millies, which is something that we really look at. And it also has um, uh, a very high roll number, which speaks to it having a very good a deep seated uh, kernel set. Then looking at the 600 series, we have SC649, um, the, which has been termed the desert walker. It's a very good variety, which, which you can also consider with the ability to withstand periods of moisture stress owing to its stay green character. Then we also have SC659, they're being held by our seasoned global head, uh, Dr. Mawiae, that is SC659. It's a variety of choice for your green mealy. As you can see there on the, uh, the frame on the left, where the, the cobs are uniform in terms of size, you can tell the crop is dark green, and you can tell even the size of the cobs that they are long and attractive. So it's another variety that you can consider, SC659, and it will mature within around 115 days for green millies, which is to say it will reach the soft door or milk door stage at that time, uh, guided by the heat units in your area and the management employed. Then we have the firecracker, SC608. This variety for green millies is really one of the varieties that farmers opt for owing to its exceptional roasting qualities. And just to say that we will be availing more yellow maize varieties to complement SC608 as we move into the next season. But it's a variety of choice for your green mealy, good exceptional roasting qualities. It sells out quite quickly if you're going on the market because it will, um, it will, it, uh, it will be produced by very few people. So it means you have a selling edge. Then moving to the Blockbuster 700 series varieties, both SC719 and SC727. 727 having been termed the Casa Banana variety are exceptional varieties that can be used for green millies. Why? Because they produce the largest, largest hob, which for green millies is something of concern for every farmer. So this is something that you really might want to consider. And still, at this time, you can still establish your 700 series variety. It will reach uh, the green milli stage at around uh, plus or minus 120 days, which is to say that with irrigation, you can complement and before the onset of the winter or just as the winter sets in within the, within the early um, weeks of May, you will be going onto the market with your green millies, even if it's the 727 variety. So you have a wide range of options from the 400 series to the 500 series you will have sizable cobs for you to go on the market and be competitive. So as we move towards concluding, CITCO continues to avail new genetics year after year in a bid to mitigate the effects of climate change as we avail climate smart varieties. So we have um, the take home message that we want to leave with every farmer. Why green millies? It's a lucrative venture. 
How lucrative is it? Because it has a high return on investment and it increases cash flows. When can I do my green millies? I can do my green millies before winter or after winter. And I can do my green millies throughout the year if I'm in a frost free area. With what? You need to have the right seed. Otherwise, you might be employing resources at the wrong thing and not get the value that you want. So the right seed is the best way for you to start. Start right and be sure to get the highest return. Then after you get the right seed, then what? How am I going to get the high return? By employing good agronomic practices. So this slide just summarizes what you need to be doing for you to get a higher return in green mealy production. There we are seeing some of the green mealy testimonials or profit stories uh, from the farmers who established the seed varieties. 608, they having been established at pre cap farm in Pepe, which is the president's farm. And we are seeing there some, um, some, some, farmer, some buyers who had come through. We had at the time when we visited farmers who were coming through from Blawayo, from farmers who were coming through from Harare to just come and buy this green mealy crop. You can see it's a mountain of green mealies. Then we have there from Glenara Estates, 608 as well established, as well as 727 being sold, but they also produce it for grain. Then we are really advocating for the farmers with irrigation to consider green mealy as a crop of choice. There we are seeing Mr. and Mrs. Mabawua from Goromonzi establishing their green mealy crop. This was just last week uh, on the 1st of uh, February, because they are saying every year on the 1st of February, they establish their crop and they will be well within the selling window just before winter or as the winter sets in. And last year, they had a very lucrative return whereby they managed to increase this year from the five hectares to 10 hectares of green millies, which they are establishing. So that is SC727 that was being established and it's just last week. So in conclusion, allow me to quote the words of the two-time president, uh, Kunumi Adesina, who said, and I quote, by 2030, the size of the food and agribusiness in Africa will reach a trillion. So if you are thinking of how to make money, that's the sector to be in. And allow me to quote our permanent secretary's mantra for this year, which is going for growth 2023. So we are going for growth together and we can only do so by starting right with the right seed and employing good agronomic practices. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, profitable green mealy production webinar.